During the Second World War, thousands of sailors found themselves under enemy fire. Whether they were soldiers of the Allies or fighting for the Axis powers, there are innumerable military cemeteries dedicated to them along the French coast. Reading their names on the graves and remembering the fate of the warships on which they had embarked, questions still need to be answered. Strangely enough, it is often the most interesting incidents which are overlooked. In order to understand these distant tales of shipwrecks, it is sometimes necessary to leave aside the history books. We have to search through documents, listen to accounts, and follow the adventures of certain brave enthusiasts, determined to see that one day the truth is finally revealed. One of the bloodiest shipwrecks of all time happened in France only a few miles off the coast of Brittany. On the 17th of June 1940, just before 4 p.m., KG-30 squadron Luftwaffe planes bombed a huge liner. If you ask people in the street today what was the worst British maritime disaster, they'd almost certainly say Titanic. And that's not just because of Kate Winslet, but they would say Titanic. Lancastria, no. The Lancastria sank in less than 25 minutes. The moment that ship was sunk like that, it, it should have been in the history books as, as a complete loss, not in doubts of why it happened. That I can't understand. Why did it happen? The number of victims of this disaster is estimated at between five and seven thousand, at least three times as many as the Titanic. Most of them were British soldiers. Despite the enormity of the tragedy, London decided to keep it from the public. The tragedy of the Lancastria became a state secret. You realise that these things aren't just transient, they, are, you know, they, they echo down through generations for, for a long time. Mark Hurst knows only too well what he's talking about. As a descendant of one of the survivors of the shipwreck, the Lancastria has always been a part of his life, rather like a family secret. As spokesman for the Scottish Parliament, he approached the Royal Navy and in his official role, requested the file on the Lancastria. 
the equally official response was negative. The documents are classified for a hundred years. It was, uh, it was a surprise to me to, do, to discover that 70 years on, there was still uh, effective censorship in place. One of the exemptions that uh, surprised me the most was uh, an exemption which says that disclosure of the information would prejudice the effective conduct of public affairs. It strikes me as very odd, 70 years after the Lancastria sunk, that uh, the British government are still withholding information. And the bottom line is for families and relatives that there is a real sense of, of anger and outrage that they're still doing this. So why is there this wall of silence? What truth is the British government concealing after all these years? For Reg Brown, one of the last remaining survivors of the Lancastria, the idea of not having an answer to these questions during his lifetime is intolerable. Why a hundred years? There must be something wrong somewhere. If, if they can't tell us why, then there's something wrong. Why did that disaster happen? We, we won't know the truth until 100 years hence. We'll all be dead. No one can complain. 70 years have passed since the ship sank. One by one, witnesses are going to their graves. Like Walter, Mark's grandfather, taking his doubts with him. But today, on both sides of the channel, the need to unveil the truth is gaining the upper hand. For the marine archaeologist Michel Law, the wreck of the Lancastria is a bit like a beacon a marker to prevent us forgetting. At first we said, how is it that we know so little about such a recent shipwreck? And that's when we decided to make sure the wreck was protected. It's absolutely imperative that our generation should preserve these boats, because otherwise in 150 or 200 years, people will say, why? They were under their noses. Why didn't they do something to preserve them, to try to find out what really happened to these vessels? They couldn't be bothered. They just let them disintegrate. In the harbour of Saint-Nazaire, in the centre of the channel, is a buoy which marks the position of the wreck. The Lancastria lies 20 metres down. The difficulty for dives to the Lancastria is that at the ebbing tide, when the sea draws back, the water actually comes from the River Loire, which is very dirty so there's no visibility. And at high tide, when there might be enough clear water coming from the open sea, we get all these particles in suspension from the dredging which has to be done for the safety of boats entering the port. So the Lancastria is almost impossible to dive to and hardly ever attempted. It. It's like liquid mud. The wreck is masked in opaque liquid, a metaphor for the mysteries still surrounding the tragedy. In the spring of 1940, Mark Hurst's grandfather was about 60 kilometers from Saint-Nazaire. He had been appointed to the building of the airport along with the British Expeditionary Forces. It's, uh, it's in a very bad state now, but uh, in some ways this is the, the tangible experience for me coming to this site because this might be the the, uh, the wood that my, my grandfather crafted uh, and so obviously it has a very strong emotion for me because it brings home the, 
the reality of what the war meant for my grandfather before the evacuation. This is the building where all the British soldiers were listening to the BBC on the 4th of June 1940. Over the airwaves, Winston Churchill solemnly announced the evacuation of British troops from French soil. Sir, we must be very careful not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuation. But there was a victory inside. It was a big shock for the men because they had spent their time here preparing for the war, preparing to take on the Germans, and without even seeing any action, they were now being told that they were on their way back to the United Kingdom uh, in retreat. The retreat was desperate. More than 250,000 soldiers still had to get back to the United Kingdom as quickly as possible. The men who are at Bougainé, uh, when they hear this radio broadcast, uh, understand that for their families at home they will think that they, they will be safe and well and on their way home for a reunion but the reality is that these men are now facing the biggest danger of their lives from london military headquarters organized the evacuation in the greatest secrecy France was falling to pieces, and the German ogre was devouring everything in its path. To get a better understanding of this crucial moment in history, we went to London to meet with Eric Grove, an expert on the period. He is known for his uncompromising approach. The Germans had moved so surprisingly quickly in the French campaign that they seemed to be supermen. They could be everywhere or, and anywhere. German tanks might suddenly come into sight down the road. The German air force was everywhere, bombing everything that moved. So there was this extraordinary pressure on people. We've got to get to the ports, we've got to get out. The Germans knew there was a big concentration of shipping off Saint-Nazaire and that probably an evacuation would be taking place. And clearly, the Germans wanted to prevent, as much as they could, British forces getting out of France and getting back to Britain. So, it was every man for himself. The British soldiers hurried to the ports of Brittany, including Saint-Nazaire. The Royal Navy requisitioned a number of civil buildings, the largest of which was a luxury liner, the majestic Lancastrian. There were a number of boats anchored here to evacuate the troops, and also boats ferrying the soldiers who kept arriving between Saint-Nazaire and the coast, because there was a permanent flux of fugitives. It was an exodus. That's why at first they only took the military, but later also civilians. So they began to take civilians on board, and then they stopped counting. About two o'clock, we got on the last boat to go out to the Lancashire. When we got to Lancashire, they stopped counting at 6,000. Apparently there was 9,000 on board. Nine thousand men were crammed onto this cruise liner built for 2,500 people. But it was only for a journey of a few hours and everyone on board thought they would be back in England before nightfall, safe and sound. In the morning of the 17th, two Royal Naval officers had boarded the Lancastria and instructed Captain Sharp to load as many men as possible and without regard to the limits set down under international law. And uh, Harry Grattage, who was second in command, asked them if this was capitulation. And they responded, don't even mention the word, just load them. Colonel 187, cross 
The British High Command did not realize that it had just taken a decision which put thousands of lives in danger. The German reconnaissance services followed the suspect maneuvers in the port of Saint-Nazaire. And at the airbase at Chiev in Belgium, the elite Luftwaffe bombardiers set off. For decades, all evidence of the German airstrikes remained buried at the bottom of the archives, until a young German historian, Sonkel Nietzsche, brought it to light. U88, warum diese Schiffe? Das waren the Germans used Squadron 30 to stop the British soldiers going back, to avoid a future battle, and so claimed victory. Highly experienced pilots from the unit have been specially trained in attacks on boats. The flight to San Nazaire was long, and the pilots thought they wouldn't get there before the boats left. Unfortunately, the captain of the Lancastria decided to wait until the other boats were also full, so they could leave in convoy. This turned out to be a tragic decision. When they arrived at their destination, the German pilots found a dream target. The Lancastria was still at anchor in the mouth of the River Loire. A salvo of bombs ripped through the Lancastria. The clandestine evacuation turned to tragedy. Thousands of men were to lose their lives. The ceiling came in, and at the same time, the ship went like that. And I thought, well, it's, it's hit now, so I'm off. The Junkers 88 was one of the best aircraft the Germans had. It dived at the ship. It didn't drop them from a great height, and the bombs all hit the ship and caused huge damage. Each bomb was big, and it killed hundreds of people at once. Number two hold uh, received a direct hit, and in that hold were 800 RAF uh, ground personnel, and virtually all of them were, were wiped out in that, in that instant. I don't blame the RAF, but they're first on board and they chose the cabins. And there were so many people on board, moving around, 9,000, that they couldn't have opened the doors to get out. Bays through the ship are narrow, they get crowded, people walk on top of each other, there's panic. Uh, it's a terribly confused situation, and it's very, very difficult for people to find a way up. It is still impossible to state today precisely how many victims there were. What is incredibly bad luck was that the bomb fell on the chimney, because it probably would have suffered damage, but nothing as serious as that. It sank incredibly quickly, in about 30 minutes. And the nearest land was, I'll tell you in kilometers, was seven kilometers away. Once in the water, the horror really began because there was thick oil. Uh, Lancaster was carrying 1,400 tonnes of uh, fuel oil and uh, that had ruptured uh, in the attack. And this began to spread out over uh, the, the site of the sinking ship and men began, it went in the nostrils. Men were swallowing it, uh, instantly vomiting. It was stinging the eyes, it was getting into the ears and it caused more, more horror for them. I had to virtually move bodies out of the way to get through. It's frightening. Imagine me, only just 20 years old. That's frightening. There were hundreds of bodies in the water. People with, with a May West, a May West life jacket is called. But when you use a May West, you have to tuck your fingers in there and elbows in like that and jump. Not like that. Break your neck. There was uh, one survivor told me how he ended up in, in the water and there was a survivor at the other end and they were holding on to a large plank of wood with one survivor at one end and the other at the other end. 
and uh, as the Germans came in and strafed the men, they shot, they, a, a shot went right through his head in front, of his, in front of him. And he remembers shouting up to the skies, to the Germans, shouting, you bastards. The pilots were sheltered from the human dimension of the tragedy, shielded from the reality of the deaths in their aircraft. For them, it was a sporting challenge, rewarded by success in terms of how many they killed. A fighting spirit rewarded by decoration. After one of their fellow pilots received the Iron Cross of the German army, they all wanted to take part in the competition. The large luxury liner keeled over 15 minutes after it was attacked. Thousands of soldiers were trapped in the hull. I got hold of the table and sat on it and it sank. <laughs> I couldn't use that. So I, I, all of a sudden I felt the current taking me out to sea. You can't swim. There's nowhere to go. Uh, you go with the current. And I thought, well, this is it. Uh, I'm prepared to go now. The tide was actually taking men out to sea. And eventually, uh, they man the boats, the rescue boats, managed to coordinate themselves into a large arc, and like a fishing net. And then I saw a ship. And they came right alongside, and they threw uh, a rope down. So I managed to hold that, and they pulled me in. In London, Winston Churchill decided that the disaster had to be kept quiet at all costs. England was the last of Germany's enemies in Europe. Bad news of this kind could have affected British morale. The British myth of 1940 is still very important to our national identity. Uh, Britain standing alone against the dreadful German threat. Uh, Dunkirk, the British Army is saved, and then it's Britain on its own. Uh, when you come to the detail of this, uh, you find that it's not quite like that. We're looking at the second greatest shipwreck of all time. Paradoxically, this ship was totally forgotten because the news of its sinking was immediately silenced by Churchill. Obviously, it was terrible. But it wasn't a good idea to worry people even more when the news was already so bad. They decided to classify the information, and so the story slipped quietly away. This was the second sinking of the Lancastria. She disappeared almost completely from collective memory. It took decades before historians and associations formed by survivors once again drew attention to the ship, which in the meantime had quietly vanished in the sediment and in people's memory. Airmen and merchant seamen who lost their lives or received injuries. On the 17th of June 1940, the history books mention only France's surrender. However, on the same day, the world experienced one of the greatest marine catastrophes of all time. The sinking of the Lancastria claimed eight times as many victims as that of the Titanic. For the 2,500 survivors of the Lancastria, time brought no answers. Now it is their descendants who shoulder the heavy legacy. When he told the story of the Lancastria, uh, he, he had one or two pints in him. He wasn't a big drinker, but he, he got drunk very easily. And, but the rest of the time, he was a very quiet man. I think he thought a lot about what happened on, on that day, and I think much of it haunted him. I think there was a certain element of embarrassment on, on one hand, because there was an aspect when he was in the water where he had to kill 
a, another survivor of a man who was crazed. He was out, out, out of his mind and trying to grab the, the life jacket on him. And he had to fight him off. He had to, he had to for his own life, it was him or the, the other man. And I think that haunted him for the rest of his days. And that had an impact on my father, who similarly echoed what his own father was like and didn't show much affection for us and was almost very remote. He's a changed man now. But I think uh, you, you realise that these things aren't just transient. They, are, you know, they, they echo down through generations for, for a long time. In 2040, when the file on the Lancastra is officially declassified, Mark Erster will be 70. Will he finally be freed from this terrible secret?